Hey, uh, two weeks ago, I ended our last sermon from the book of Romans by putting this image up on the screen and then summarizing Romans chapter 8 with, with these words. You will be judged. What's that sound? But you will be judged, uh, but not by Antonin Scalia, Judge Judy on TV, or Ruth Bader Ginsburg. You will be judged, and you have been judged, by your creator. And this is his judgment. You must be born again. The only place safe from that judgment is hell. And then only for a time, for even there, the judgment of God will find you. You must be born again. That's what Jesus said, you remember, to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Just uh, um, a little bit after that, he then made the statement that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that everyone believing in him should not perish but have eternal life, the life of the age to come born again. You didn't decide to be born the first time, but because you were born, born, you, you have decided all sorts of things, right? So perhaps you can't simply decide to be born again, but because you are born again, you can decide. You can have faith, the life of the age to come. You must be born again which can also be translated, you must be born from above or you must be begotten from above. Actually, it should be you all must be born again because the you is plural in the Greek. You all must be born again. Jesus said this to Nicodemus the Pharisee and apparently he also said it to Paul the the Pharisee. According to Paul in Romans 8, this truth isn't just for a few old Pharisees. This truth is for all creation including all of humanity. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 49, Paul wrote this, For just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Then verse 52, We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. The dead shall be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. In other words, you must be born again. Born of water and born of spirit. How anyone could not be begotten from above and then born again already is is kind of one of the great mysteries of Scripture because the one that spoke those words is the Word of God by whom all things are created and are sustained. In Genesis 1, God speaks his word and and reality happens until on the seventh day, everything has happened, everything is finished, and everything is good. But on the sixth day, God speaks his, his word, and for a time, apparently, it doesn't seem to happen. God says, let us make Adam, man, in our own image and likeness, and in a million billion little ways you and I say, nope, (laughs) let us not be. Let us not love. Let us sin, let us remain in darkness, lies, death, and hell. Let us not be the image of God. And yet even though we choose darkness, lies, death, and hell, even though we descend into Hades and hide from the eternal fire, that is in fact love, God's word is simple and it's clear. Y'all must be born again. That's the judgment. That's the gospel. And once you see it and begin to see it throughout all of scripture, it's only natural to ask why for the last 1600 years have we so very rarely heard it preached in the institutional church? Well, take a look at the picture up there on the screen, a judge with a gavel on the left, and a newborn baby with an umbilical cord about to be cut on the right. Take a look at that picture, and as an authorized pastor in the institutional church, let me tell you why you don't often hear this preached. You see, I 
can do that thing on the left. <laughs> I can give you knowledge of good and evil, the law, and I can teach you how to judge, even if that judgment is only an illusion, a bad dream. I can do the thing on the left, but I can't do the thing on the right. At best, I can make a proclamation. That's what it means to preach, to proclaim something. And I can hope that by the grace of God, that proclamation contains a word, a word that is living and active, a word that is an imperishable and promised seed. And then I can pray that through the vicissitudes, trials, and traumas of life, our hearts would be broken, open, and fertile such that we would conceive of that word and give birth to faith and be born into a new creation. We're conceived in this womb of a world and we're born out of this world into another world. I can't do the thing uh, on the right. Only God can do that. I, I can do the thing on the left. I can do the thing on the left, but only God does the thing on the right, and yet he does it through us, his church. Not an institution, but a bride. The bride of Christ and his mother. <laughs> Crazy. So let's pray. Lord God, we ask that you would help us to preach your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Almost 34 years ago now, I was playing guitar in our bedroom in California. When my wife Susan screamed from the bathroom, she screamed, you keep that up and I'll go into labor right here. And so of course I kept playing loud and not very well. I still can do that. And all of a sudden I heard a scream from the bathroom. Susan's water had broken. Her water had broken. She was five and a half weeks early. We were in a new town. I didn't know where the hospital was. I found the address in the phone book, if you remember those. We drove like crazy all the way to the hospital. Water, blood, fluid all over the car. That night, every woman in Northern California was having a baby. The maternity wing was like a mass unit. Susan had about 24 hours of hard labor. I had never, ever witnessed a person in that much pain before. By the time Jonathan was finally born, there was literally a bucket full of blood underneath my, my bride. She was passing out from pain and exhaustion. I was traumatized just watching. I remember thinking to myself, thinking, Peter, if this, if this baby lives, you better enjoy this baby, because this is the last baby you'll ever have. There's no way she's going She's going through this again. But the moment the doctor held up our son, the moment Susan was able to lift our head and get a, a good look at him, she just blurted out, oh, I want another one. And I remember thinking to myself, something really strange just happened. Something really weird, something really holy just happened. On Thursday night, which in Jewish reckoning is the start of Good Friday, that's the sixth day of the week, Jesus said to his disciples, your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come, but when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Just a few days before that on Palm Sunday, sitting on the Mount of Olives, looking at the Old Stone Temple, having just heard Jesus describe the temple's destruction, the disciples turned to Jesus and they asked him this, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus talks about wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes. He talks about rejection, division, and hatred. Have you ever heard rumors of wars and Famines and earthquakes or experience maybe a little rejection and hatred. And then Jesus refers to all those things as the beginning of the birth pains. When Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, 
preaches the gospel on Pentecost, he says to his fellow Jews, you crucified Jesus. And God raised him up, loosing the birth pains of death. Birth pains is often in English Bibles just translated pangs or pains because uh, birth pains obviously doesn't make sense to the translator. But it made sense to Peter. It means that the very worst thing, the death of the Messiah, is also the very best thing, the birth of the Messiah. Susan just yelled out, <laughs> oh, I, I want another one. And so last week, or last time, two weeks ago, at the end of the message, I asked you, what if in a moment of great stress and failure, someone said to you, you're not dying, you're giving birth. And I told you the story of my friend at the gas station, you know, who thought his girlfriend was dying, only to be told by the doctor, she's not dying, she's giving birth. The news turned a funeral into a party. Party with streamers, balloons, cigars, at the, even at the gas station. My friend lost his psyche and found it, and their sorrow turned into joy. What if in a moment of great stress and failure, someone told you you're not dying, you're giving birth? Or what if they told you you're being born? Or what if they told you, actually, both things are happening at once? Both. As Jesus and Paul taught, humanity is Jesus' mother. And that must be why Jesus called himself the Son of Man, right? We talked about that. God is his Father, and man, humanity, is his mother. So happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Y'all are giving birth, whether you want to or not. We've also learned that Christ in you is somehow the new you. Jesus the Christ is the judgment of God in flesh, but the flesh is that thing that you have built with what you think is your own judgment, your old you. How I am again in birth pains with you until Christ be formed within you, wrote Paul to the Galatians. So Christ is born of man, old Adam, and together we all become the bottom body of, of that man, the, the eschatos man, the superman, the image of God. And so this actually is our situation that we've been talking about. This actually is our situation right now. Our old man is giving birth to our new man. We cannot create our true selves, but we're giving birth to ourselves. We are actually not the result of our own judgment, not the result of our own labor, but we will labor because we're giving birth and being born, and that's the judgment of God. Well, as I was saying, up to that point, I had never witnessed a person in so much pain, up to, up to that, that point. So much pain is when my wife was giving birth to my son up to that point because then when my son was born, I suddenly realized that travail is not only hard on mom, it's really, really hard on the one that's being born. John had a black eye. He was covered in bruises. If this won't give you a headache, I don't know what will. His head was literally pressed into the shape of a cone and he wouldn't stop screaming. Just screaming in obvious distress and, and pain, abject terror, being born is terrifying and painful, so painful that you probably blocked it out. Do you remember it, Doug? Do you remember being born? See, yeah, you blocked it out. See, it's so painful. It's no wonder that we're a bit stressed about being born again. Just imagine what it was like the, the first time. You're floating in a warm jacuzzi, kept at a constant 98.6 degrees. Everything you need, oxygen, nutrition, is supplied by the placenta and this amazing cord, the cord that hooks up to the placenta in the umbilical sac, or whatever it's called, the umbilical cord, and it's actually part of you genetically. It's part of you, what, what you think is maybe the most important part of you, that part that attaches you to your 
womb world. You, you don't realize this at the time, but it brings you life from another world. Life from another world into the womb world. Well, imagine being born. Suddenly, your security turns into insecurity. Your sense of control is revealed to be an illusion. Your entire world begins to turn against you and expel you. We learned this from the doctors when John, Jonathan was being born. Travail, and this is why they, they, didn't, they didn't want to do a cesarean, but keep it going. Travail actually crushes you. <laughs> It forces the fluid, the water from the lungs. In, in the womb, a baby actually breathes water, am, amniotic fluid in the amniotic sac. And so breathing seems, well, well, it seems entirely pointless in the womb. Travail, though, forces an infant to expire that, that world, that one world, in order to inspire an entirely new world where breathing the spirit is far from pointless. But you, the infant, don't know that at the time. You just know confusion and pain. You pass through a dark tunnel into a blinding light. You're born naked and exposed, and then someone takes what you think is the most vital, important part of you, that part that was your security, that part that brought you oxygen, breath, and nutrition, that, that, that part that kept you alive in the womb, the umbilical cord. They take it and they just cut it, judge it, leaving a wound. Imagine the trauma of being born. I mean, in the process, wouldn't you wonder, is there even such a thing as a mother? Is there life after birth? Is there life beyond the womb? Imagine a twin watching the birth of a brother from inside the womb. Martin Luther said, watching the death of a child of God is like watching a birth from inside the womb. You, you, you feel the pressure, you feel the pain, and then you see your companion lose what seems to be everything to you. That, that womb world, entire womb world, that's what you see. But what you don't see is the party on the other side. Laughing doctors, relatives with balloons and cigars, a mother beaming with pride. You don't yet feel the arms of the Father holding you tightly against his chest. But when John, my firstborn, was born, we were so relieved and so incredibly happy, and yet John was absolutely traumatized. They, they let me cut the cord, I remember. The nurse cleaned him up. She wrapped him in swathing clothes, placed him in my arms, but he still wouldn't stop shaking. He still wouldn't stop trembling. He still wouldn't stop screaming and just wailing, and who could blame him? And then the nurse said, talk to him. He knows your voice. And I said, Scooter? That's what we called him, because we didn't know if he was a boy or a girl at the time. I mean, we did after he was born, I should tell you. <laughs> but before. <laughs> That's another story. Anyway, I said, Scooter? And instantly, he stopped crying. He grew still. Shabbat, Sabbath, rest, he was home. And for the second time that terrifying day, I suddenly realized that something really strange, really weird, really wonderful, and, and entirely holy had just happened. And then I began to wonder, how did he know my voice? Last October, when we preached through Romans 1, I told you. I had taken an indelible black magic marker. Indelible was a mistake because Susan had to go to the doctor later, it turned out. But I had taken this marker and I had drawn a big smiley face on her belly. And every night I would talk to her belly saying, Scooter, I hope you're doing great in there. I can't wait to hold you out here. I love you. Just imagine when I spoke everything in that womb world would move. Everything in that world would vibrate to the sound of my voice, and yet my voice, my word, was not a thing in that world. It could not be found in that world or explained by that world. So, so do you know of things in this world that cannot be found in this world or explained by this world, but everyone seems to, like, you know, assume in this world? How about truth, or logic, 
or reason. You can't explain why truth is true or logic is logical or reason is reasonable. You can't dissect those things in a lab, put them in a box. You can't prove them, but everyone assumes them or is assumed by them, maybe even known by them. How about love? Love is the opposite of the way of this world. Love is not the survival of the fittest. Love is the sacrifice of the fittest. How about life? How about consciousness? We've talked about that. How about spirit? Some argue that there is no God, for they are aware, they are conscious that their life in this world is afflicted with a lack of truth, logic, reason, and love, but they don't stop to ask, what is truth? Logic, reason, love, life itself. And why am I capable of even being conscious of those things? Scripture claims that God is love. And his word is truth and reason, the logos, and his judgment, that is his commandment, that is his word, is eternal life, which is an endless communion of sacrificial love. Well, perhaps it's important to learn to trust his voice here so that we would rest in his arms there. I suspect that those who say they don't believe in God deeply resent God. For they long for God, but cannot comprehend God, contain God, or possess God. I mean, they have knowledge about God, but they cannot grasp God. All they can grasp is, is what? An umbilical cord. Martin Luther noted that if a baby in a womb could reason, surely that baby would wonder, what, what are hands for? What are eyes for? What's, what's a mouth for? What are, what are lungs for? They seem pointless. But then the baby might think, but, but this umbilical cord? Dang, this is everything. This is my world. It's life. Last time I shared the vision that my wife received at communion a few years ago. She saw an umbilical cord running from Jesus Christ crucified on the tree to an old scar on her belly that I find actually rather attractive. We call it a belly button. You know that one day your body will be unable to digest bread and wine? In fact, a day is coming when life will no longer flow through the bag of dust that you think of as yourself. We each have a physical body, like we've talked about, and we each have a psychic body. And through them, for a time, our Father in heaven mediates breath or spirit from another world. To us, in this womb of a world, the spirit is life, but for a time, it's mediated through flesh. The flesh is temporal. The spirit is eternal. Well, Jonathan knew my voice. For his entire world vibrated to the sound of my voice, although I was not a thing in his world. And through that cord, he received spirit from my world into his womb world. But you see, he wasn't destined, predestined to stay in that world. To pray constantly is to listen to your father's voice in every moment of space and time. And to come to communion is to breathe his breath through bread and wine in the inner sanctuary, that inner tent in your soul. Because John rested in me in that womb of a world, he fell silent in my arms in this world, and he knew he was home. But just imagine the trauma of being born. And imagine a twin in the womb watching a big brother or sister being born. I mean, in, in horror, if that was you, watching a big brother or sister being born, I mean, in horror, you might cry out, surely there is no mother, surely there is no father, and this is not right, and whatever you do, big brother, do not walk into that light. <laughs> or you might assume, maybe there is a father, and he's not right. So you better run from the light, and if you can't run from the light, you better make yourself right, you better make yourself worthy of the light. When John fell silent in my arms, I thought, 
wow, something utterly strange, weird, wonderful, and holy just happened. But I think the very best thing happened about a year later. Jonathan was holding me with his hands, looking into my eyes with his eyes, breathing my breath with his breath when he said, ba, 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 da, 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 he, he said my name. It was his spirit in communion with my spirit returning to me as a word of love. I received that word as the greatest of all miracles and I called out to Susan, Susan, Jonathan just said my name. He said, daddy. And then I set Jonathan down in the corner and I said, how dare you think that you are worthy to say my name? <laughs> Before you dare speak my name, I expect you to graduate from high school, maybe get an advanced degree in Christian counseling from an accredited Christian higher learning institution, and maybe you could pay rent. Maybe you could start with that. You could just pay rent, and, and, then, and then I'll decide if you're worthy or unworthy to speak my name. Actually, I didn't say that. What can make John worthy to say my name? And yet, saying my name gave him a sense of worth that I think helped make him who he is. And I think I'd die just to hear him say my name, for that is worth everything to me. Because <laughs> I'm his dad. And that's my judgment. Well, anyway, <laughs> imagine the trauma of being born. And imagine the trauma of watching an older sibling be born. Paul wrote that Jesus is the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Even though he said brothers, because you understand the way the language works, right? Firstborn among many brothers. Firstborn of all creation. Firstborn from the dead. We all know that Jesus is the word of God our Father. So you see, this means we don't only hear the word or the voice of our Father in creation all around us all the time, and we don't only receive the spirit of life in this sacrament of communion. This means that the word of our Father, who is the life, wrapped himself in flesh and was born into our world. So that even as we broke his body and he delivered up his spirit, so that even as we took his life and he gave his life, we could watch his birth. From inside this womb of a world, as he was born into another world, and then believe his words as to return to this world on Sunday, saying, my dad is your dad. And when you pray, say, our dad, Abba, Father. And so, what's the meaning of the cross? What's the meaning of that judgment? Does it reveal that if you don't find a way to make yourself worthy, what happened to Jesus will happen to you, but not for a day, but instead for all eternity? Forever without end, God will put you, maybe put you back into a dark place where you experience endless travail, but never be born because you're not worthy to say Abba. Or does it mean that you too must be born? Just as Jesus was born. For you are already worth absolutely everything to God our Father. <laughs> well, that's the introduction to my sermon. So now, before we end, I should read the text. Verse 12, Romans 8. So then, brothers and sisters, we're debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you're about to die. And Paul already said the mind of the flesh is death. Thinking that way is death. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, remember the body that only lives for itself, that is alone in the dark. If you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery, to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of huiothesius, sonship, 
When we cry, Abba, Daddy, Dad, Father, it's that spirit, that spirit, bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And you remember we preached on this. He inherits what? The cosmos. Joint heirs with Christ since we suffer. Simpasco, sim suffer passion with him since we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him sin doxazo glory together i consider writes paul that the sufferings the passions of this present time well they're not even worth being compared with the glory that is about to be revealed to us for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of god for the creation was subjected to futility subordinated to pointlessness is how David Bentley Hart translates that. That word uh, translated as futility is the Greek word that was used by the Jews to translate the Hebrew word hevel, that means something like vapor, and, and that gets translated into English as vanity. So Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanities, all is vanity and striving after the wind, the ruach. We strive after wind our entire time in this womb of a world only to discover why. That the wind of God has always been striving after us. <laughs> so cool. Verse 20, the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. Subjected to futility, futility. So that wasn't us. <laughs> See, if, if you think this world was messed up simply because of human choice, Paul appears to put the responsibility elsewhere. There can actually be no human choice unless God first chooses to give that choice to humans, unless he first chooses to, like, I don't know, plant a tree of knowledge and a pre tree, tree of life in the middle of a garden, leave two naked, half-baked, ignorant humans alone with an evil talking snake that obviously slithered into that garden from someplace else that was already futile. God subjected creation to futility. He subordinated all of this to pointlessness. In hope, in hope. That means that there is a point to all the pointlessness. Perhaps the point of the pointlessness is to make us all long for the point. Perhaps the purpose of purposelessness is to make us all long for the purpose. The purpose of the dark is the revelation of the light. The knowledge of evil prepares us to be known by the good. The reason for chaos is the revelation of the logos. The reason for sin is the glory of grace. The reason for condemnation is the glory of justification. The reason for desecration is the revelation of our own creation. The reason for striving after the wind is to know that the wind has always been striving after you. The reason we can't get anything done is to know that we are the something that has been done. The reason for lungs in a world of water is that you and I are being prepared to breathe the Spirit in another world. Verse 20, creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation, not some of the creation, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay. You know, physicists are utterly mystified by decay and by time. They see no reason why we seem to move in only one direction in time. And they're puzzled by the fact that the only way we know which direction we are moving in time is the fact that things only decay in one direction. And so we decay, and so we're slaves of time and two time, that's the second law of thermodynamics. In a closed system, entropy increases. All things decay in a closed system. Sin is a closed system. But God is love. And God is eternal. He is I am that I am. Creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. 
Read the Revelation, you'll find out that God himself is the glory and the glory of the children of God. And he's filling us, and he will fill all things in time, and yet he is eternally everything. And so space and time itself is like a womb in the eternal reality that is our God. This old creation and your old self are both like a womb that contains your new self, who, check this out, is the very presence of your creator. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, the good, the faith in you is not just you, but Christ in you, in communion with you, in the eternal now of the inner tent in the temple of your soul. You see, fear of condemnation cannot exist in a place like that, for judgment has already been made, and all the judgments are good. The fruits of the Spirit are the judgments of God being made in you and made in perfect freedom. Freedom, for there you will will what you want and want what you will, for what you will is called reality. It's our eternal home. And what you thought was our home is something more like a bad dream. Verse 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning, groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for huyothesion, sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Our true self is imprisoned in our false self, and so we groan. But we need not groan in despair. We must groan in, groan in hope, for, for our old man is giving birth to our new man and an entire new creation in which every futility will be transformed by eternity. Verse 20, 24, for in this hope, now in Greek there's an article there before the word hope, and that means that Paul is talking about the hope that he just uh, described, an entire new creation. In this hope, we were saved. In this hope, that can be translated we were delivered. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it, eagerly expect it with patience. Sometimes Christians talk as if we should never groan. But if we never groan, we never hope. And it's in this hope that we're saved that we are delivered. The more, the more you, you know our Lord, the closer you come to joy, and yet the deeper you will groan. For you will know this world is not my home or anybody's home. Verse 26, likewise the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the very Spirit intercedes with sighs, literally groanings too deep for words. Do you see, God chooses to be born in us, through us, and with us. So even if you groan, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's not just you. It's him in you, being born again again in you and with you. Verse 27, and God who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. God talks to himself about you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit talks to himself about you, in you, and through you all the time. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Who has God not called according to his purpose? For those whom he foreknew who does God not know other than that which is like an illusion, like your false self, the lie that you sometimes call you, the, the me that you think you have created? Verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his, his son, who's free, right? predestined to freedom. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be 
the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, and those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now you might notice that all of that is past tense. That means that it's already happened. And that, my friends, is a pretty solid hope. As if this really is the eternal judgment of God. In this hope, we are saved. In this hope, we are delivered from our old body of sin and death and joined to a kingdom of eternal, ecstatic, and unspeakable life. When my last son Coleman was born, we had the kingdom all prepared. I mean, I was a pro by this point, number four. So I had streamers and balloons, cigars, and I had a birthday cake for him and a birthday cake for Susan because it was their 34th birthday. All the relatives were waiting, his brothers, brother and sisters were waiting, and, and of course Susan was waiting with eager expectation. But the moment he was born, he wasn't born. We didn't hear a cry. The doctors didn't hand him to Susan or to me. They looked utterly terrified, for Coleman's head was entirely blue. The umbilical cord was wrapped like a noose twice around his neck and strangling him to death. Thanks to the quick action of the doctors, it was soon cut. Coleman let out a scream, blue turned to pink, then they put him in my arms. I spoke and he grew still. He was home. But just think of it. What seemed so important in that womb, what brought him life from the next world, that cord, was now killing him in the new creation. And what seemed so pointless in that womb of a world became sheer delight in this new world. His lungs breathed air, <gasps> wind, spirit. It's all one word in Greek, in scripture. His eyes saw light. Clearly he saw light for the first time. Scripture says God is light. His hands grasped, his skin felt what he'd only heard as distant murmuring in all those months in darkness. He felt his father's arms, he drank his mother's milk. He was home. And his umbilical cord, his everything in that womb of a world, well, it was cut away. It was judged. Thrown in the trash 27 years ago. He never even mentions it. I don't think he misses it at all, at all. <laughs> it's ironic, but seizing control, trying to save yourself, and so hanging on to this world is what traps us in death. And it's trusting the voice of our Father and surrendering control that sets us free. And all creation with us. The voice of the Father says, you must be born again. And Paul writes, in this hope, we are saved. So sometimes people ask me this question. Peter, I know the stuff you say. Um, why preach the gospel if in the end everyone gets saved? And I'm always tempted to respond because it sounds to me like you're not. But you're trapped in hell. And you're sinking deeper and deeper and deeper right now. If you don't hope in the new creation, and if you hope in something, don't you talk about it? You proclaim it? If you don't hope in the new creation, you won't want to go there when the time comes. If you don't trust the light, you will run from the light and hide in the dark in the depths of this womb of a world, what we call space and time. You may lose your physical body, but you'll be trapped in your soul. Your psychic body, the psyche of sin and death, your ego, for a time perhaps even for a long time, 
But even there, the judgment of God will find you, or maybe has always found you. As Isaiah prophesied, your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake, awake, awake from this and sing for joy, for the dew on you is a dew of light and the earth will give birth to the Raphaim, the ghosts. Why? Because you must be born again. And just by hoping in that judgment right now, it's already begun to happen. So Jesus took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. And in the same manner, he took the cup and he said, this is the covenant in my blood. And as the Lord had been teaching them for 1,500 years, the life is in the blood. The spirit is in the blood. And Christ in you, according to Paul, is the hope of glory. And yet, before long, you'll be unable, you'll be physically unable to digest bread. <laughs> or maybe even uh, pick up a cup of wine. Sorry, but that's true. Before long, your body will wither like an old umbilical cord. Before long, um, you'll see the light like Paul saw the light on the road to Damascus, brighter than the sun. And all your judgments will be exposed to the eternal judgment of God. And you'll be tempted to run from the light. But you must run into the light because you're not dying. You were dead, but now you're being born. So look directly into the light and say, Dad, <laughs> Abba, I'm home. Let's worship. You're worthy. Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. So, Lord, we sing, Holy are you. We sing, It's all about you. And then we get a good look at you. We see your hands, we see your feet, and we discover that you have made yourself and all creation about us. Because you're holy. And you are love. And you're bound and determined to make us in your own image. Thank you. Amen. You know, when Jesus rose from the dead, came back to this earth, you remember he showed his disciples something. You remember that? He showed them wounds on his hands and his, his feet, his side. They represent those places where his body had been cut away from this, this, this womb of a world. They are the stigmata of the second birth. But you all have, every one of you, I know this about you, you all have stigmata of the first birth. Since I lost five pounds the last couple of weeks, I'm going to show you mine. <laughs> this is it right here. And this is, this is what I would suggest, all right? When you get home today, you can maybe do this every day. Why don't you just gaze at it every now and then. If you, can, <laughs> you might have to use a mirror, okay? But just gaze at it. And just, just think, just think to yourself, wow, I, I used to exist alone in the darkness, and I kind of thought that I was all that there is. I had no comprehension of a mother, and yet in her I lived and moved and had my being. 
And I had no comprehension of a father, and yet he was in me because I am his seed. The only thing that mattered was this, this cord that uh, connected to this scar. But my mouth, my lips, my lungs, they all seemed pointless. And then one day, my world began to just cave in, came crashing down all around me. I thought I was dying, but I was being born. After you think about that for a while, then look up. If you have a mirror, look into the mirror at your body. It may be kind of old and wrinkled and withered like an old umbilical cord. And if it's not, don't worry, it soon will be. <laughs> look at your old body and then talk to it. Say, you know, you used to be everything to me. You used to be everything to me, my, my blood, my life. You were, you were everything to me, but, but I don't need you anymore. I'm grateful for you, but I don't need you anymore because I am predestined for freedom. I'm predestined for another world. See, I think if you do that every day, this world will begin to lose its grip on you. Not only that, the devil will begin to lose his grip on you. For the devil has kept us in lifelong bondage through the fear of death. But now you know the fear of death is the fear of birth. And the fear of the commandment of the Lord and the fear of the judgment of God. John 12, 50, I know that the Father's commandment is eternal life, said Jesus. Eternal life. And so to old Pharisees like Paul and Nicodemus and you, God issues his judgment, John chapter 3. You must be born again. In this hope, you are saved. Believe the gospel. Amen. If you'd like prayer, uh, members of the prayer team be down front. They'd love to pray with you.